Red Test. Sweet. Sour. So good to test. Hello, everyone. This is Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss. Welcome to 2013. Is anybody tired? Because I am. I'm exhausted. I, I don't know. I didn't really want to start the new year this way, but I'm totally, totally exhausted. And at least one person here knows why. Uh, but it's going to be, it's, it was, it's a wonderful exhaustion. And part of that exhaustion surrounded, is surrounded by food because we had lots of good stuff to eat over the holidays. I don't know. Did anybody have anything special that they wanted to share? Because if not, I'm going to share something that, that I had, that I made. You know, sometimes we use the word I fixed and people are always saying, what? What was wrong with it? Okay. That's it. Thank you, James, for laughing. I, I really appreciate that one person laughed. That's great. Excellent. Anyway, uh, I made this butternut squash risotto for New Year's Eve dinner, and it was really awesome. And I say that because sometimes my risotti turn out really good. Sometimes they don't turn out, you know, as good as I'd like. But this one was absolutely stellar. And if you go to the blog post on kruufm.com, you can see the color of the broth. The broth was this beautiful orange. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate that. Thumbs up. Tom Allen is here with music. He, he promises a zany tune some at some point where I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> we'll, we'll look forward to it. Anyway, uh, I want to tell you how to make it because it's so simple and it's a great winter dish. We're not going to go into how to make risotto because you all know how to make risotto, right, Janet? You know how to make risotto, right? Okay. That's what I thought. Anyway, this is very, very simple to make this beautiful, luscious risotto that's just gorgeous. All you need to, need to do is make a vegetable broth, but you're going to make a light vegetable broth. And you're just going to use some carrots, some celery, some onion, parsley, including the stems, fresh parsley, including the stems, and butternut squash, a really nice big butternut squash. doesn't matter how you cut anything up because it's all for broth and then what we're going to do after it cooks for about a couple of hours, a little white wine is great too to add into that. After it cooks for a couple of hours then you're going to take out the parsley and you're going to uh, then puree everything. Nice if you have a Vitamix or something like that where you can puree it really easily. You're going to puree it all. It's absolutely beautiful. It turns into this gorgeous orange color. If you've got, if you want to get really carried away and you've got a chinois and you want to strain it and just make it all silky smooth and everything, go right ahead. Be, make my day or make your own. But the point is that it's just going to turn into this absolutely gorgeous color. Then to add another flavor layer to your butternut squash risotto, what you're going to do is you're going to roast your butternut squash. You're going to chunk it into nice little chunks, little cubes. It's really pretty if you want to you know, use cubes. And you're going to roast it in the oven at 450 degrees, depending upon your oven for, it could be 45 minutes, could be an hour, and you want to get some caramelization on it. If you need to, you're going to stir it up after about a half hour, 35, 40 minutes, and make sure that all the sides get nice and cooked. And it's absolutely, that turns into something gorgeous too. You're going to chop a little fresh parsley to add on top of it. And so the last piece, pièce de résistance, I hope nobody speaks French here, thankfully Suzanne isn't here. Uh, you're going to get some fresh sage leaves and you're going to cook them in hot oil, crisp them up in some hot oil with salt, and so you have crispy, fresh sage leaves. And when you put it all together, you're going to serve the, you're going to put the risotto in a nice bowl after you've, you've completed it. And then you're going to sprinkle a little bit of Parmigiano Reggiano on top of the risotto, a little bit of parsley, tiny bit of parsley for a beautiful green. You're going to stick that fresh, fresh sage leaf right on top so it really looks gorgeous. And then you're going to put a little bit of that orange broth around the sides so it looks just really, really pretty. It's like this mound of risotto is floating in this orange broth, just gorgeous. I think you can make that, Darren. I think you can definitely make that. Well, we'll talk about it. We can talk about it afterwards, but, but I, I know you can do it and it'll be gorgeous, you know, when you do it. And then your pictures will be really nice. Anyway, it's, it's something that's really great for winter. And you can also do it with Faro. Everybody was here for the Risotto Faroto show. You can do it with Faro too. It'll be, it'll be really wonderful. Fresh sage is really important. 
uh, and in the risotto itself to add, again, more flavor layers, fresh sage and fresh rosemary chopped really fine is, is perfect. The, the last thing I would probably do if I had to do anything differently is I might put a few little chunks of butternut squash on top too, just to make it even prettier. But it was pretty enough, I think. And besides that, after a couple minutes, you eat it, so it's all gone. All right, so that's enough. Um, this is great taste on KRUU FM 100.1, right? Solar powered. First show of the new year. We have resolutions that we're going to make, I'm sure. One of them is that we're not starting off the year with a healthy food show, even though we've all spent a lot of time probably eating snacks and sweets. Nah, we're going to have more sweets. <laughs> That's what we're going to do, because why not? We want to start out with a sweet new year. Hallie Claire Witherspoon is here. She is going to show us how to make very simple candied nuts and candy nuts and fruit also, right? Yes. That's, that's fantastic. And Al Davis is here, and Al is going to be making his specialty, which is rugula or rugula or... Anything you want to call it, cream cheese pastry. <laughs> <There's> so, <laughs> it's, it's delicious. So whatever, and, and Al's brought some already made, so... I'm going to make that right now. You're going to make it right now. now. Have we preheated the oven? Yeah, we need to do that. Yeah, and, and you better do that, and I hope you know how to turn it on because I don't. So, so if anybody if sees that Al is struggling, please come up and save him. That's all I can say. Um, and let's see, we have one more. Ah, you're here. Excellent. Dick Alexander is here, and we're going to learn a little bit about sea urchins. And that's where you come in, right, Tom? <laughs> Turn yourself on there, buddy. <laughs> I'm sure Dick is really excited and can't wait to hear about that. All right, so one of the things that we want to do this year is we want to really focus on helping people learn how to eat healthier. And you might say, well, I listen to your show and you do that all the time, but there's something that came up in the last few days that I noticed and it, it started to bother me and that is that and we'll call we'll use quotation marks and say normal people all right the normal American person still really doesn't know what we're talking about when we're talking about eating healthy eating fresh eating local buying local contributing to the local food economy etc and this came up in a variety of ways but some friends of mine were visiting people in different states over the holidays and they experienced this in a very dramatic way because they didn't really have anything to eat for days on end because the people that they were visiting wanted to cook for them and there really wasn't anything to be cooked because everything came out of a box or it came out of a can or it was uh, in the freezer that type of thing so I started agon I didn't think about it really for for a few days but then I started agonizing about it and I realized that we need to we're really talking to ourselves every time we, we do an episode of Great Taste because the people who are listening are already cooking at home. I, I can look around the room and I know people who are cooking, you know, at, in their home. There are some people who don't, but there are most people, most people are. And they, they know how to eat well. And so we need to try to figure out ways to reach everybody. And I came up with an idea that I'm going to hope to get hy V excited about. And that is that a grocery store really doesn't care. Re right where you spend your money if you if you have a hundred and fifty dollar a week food budget for example if you spend 150 bucks a week at high V or any other grocery store they don't care if you buy frozen foods fresh foods or whatever as long as you check out you spent that you spent that money so the other thing about a grocery store is they're always doing sampling but one of the things they do is they always do the sampling in the department where the food is located so if you want to reach people who are buying frozen foods or packaged foods or canned foods, then you have to do the sampling of fresh foods where they're going in the store. Otherwise, they're never going to see you. So if you start sampling organic tomatoes, for example, in the organic section, they're never walking in there. You're never going to, you're never going to educate them about cooking fresh. So the whole idea has to be bringing the food fresh food, fresh ideas, fresh education to people in the areas where they travel throughout the grocery store. So that's something that I, I think is pretty, I think it's pretty exciting. I mean, I don't know. Everybody's sitting here looking at me. I mean, it's probably you're all still in a daze from the holidays, but that's, that's all right. Uh, 
Anybody have anything to contribute? Any ideas at all that you think could be helpful in terms of educating people about food? If you could think of something. Yes, I see that, you know, usually you're a very lively group, but this is, and you know what I start to feel like? I start to feel like the comedian, somebody like, who is it? Um, who's late night, late, late night with, uh, who's the really nice guy? Is it Conan O'Brien or Jeremy Fallon? Yeah, and he, before he comes out on stage, I was just reading this article, that he, he thinks he's really good. He doesn't have a problem thinking that. But just before he walks out on stage, he always has, there's this fear that hits him that he's going to fail and everybody's going to just like get out of here, right? You know. So that's what you guys have me feeling like right now. But that's okay. I can I can handle it because my shoulders are very big. Who had their hand up? I saw Sonny. The only thing I question that you said is you said they don't care where you spend your money, and uh, what I've heard is that they do care where you spend your money, and they kind of in the grocery uh, the way they market grocery stores is to push you in certain areas, like a checkout where you know you could spend two dollars on a thing of gum or something like that. Yeah, you're right. I mean, grocery stores are set up. I, everybody can just, I think there's a lot of chairs that still can be put out. Um, don't mind. Just do it. Make yourselves at home. Anyway, I, I think that you're right about that, Tom. Grocery stores are set up to try to... <laughs> yeah, I guess my mind also is uh, Bob. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> anyway, grocery stores are set up like that, but we can help change that. And I, I think that would be that would be a great thing to, to work on this year. So we'll see what happens. So just just a thought, and if anybody else has any other thoughts, because I think that we still have a lot of work to do to try to reach people. Yes, there is a seat up front. You you are welcome to it. Wow. <laughs> By the way, if I keep talking fast and uh, you know you can't even understand me because I'm talking so fast, it's because I've been eating way too many of my wife's coffee biscotti uh, today, and and they they pack a punch, especially when you're not used to drinking coffee. Helly? Yes. Hi. How long Hi. are you here for? Um, I'm here for about a week. A week? Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. And you're on your way back to San Francisco? That is correct. Okay. I was out there earlier um, last year. I went to baking school in San Francisco. And then I've been kind of hopping around the country working in different bakeries. And I'm going back to San Francisco for a longer time. Oh, that's great. You want to shut that door? That's awesome back there because we have to, sp even though everybody has. Do you get five points? No, you don't get any points. You might get an extra arugula if you're if you're if you're nice. We'll see what happens. Anyway, so so you graduated from the San Francisco Baking Institute right. in June, was it? Uh, in May. In May. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then in June I went out to Vermont, and I was working in a bread bakery in Vermont, um, and it was it's a artisan bread bakery. Everything is um, naturally leavened. All the breads are naturally leavened, so it's just using natural yeasts in the air. Um, sourdough starters, although. Oftentimes when you say it's a sourdough, people automatically think that it's a really sour, really tangy bread like the San Francisco sourdough, which is a typical um, sourdough bread. But there's a lot of different styles and there's a lot of breads that are naturally leavened with sourdough starters that you taste and you don't even realize that they're sourdough. Um, but they give a really nice flavor and they're just really wonderful to work with on the, on the um, production side. So I was working there. Um, for about four months, shaping bread primarily, um, which is like just shaping a lot of bread. And, and why don't you make sure that people understand what type of hours you have to put in? Oh, well, this one was actually very leisurely. Oh, Vermont, don't, don't tell I, people that. well, there's, there's a contrast. It's okay. okay. I have a contrast. So I was in Vermont for four months um, helping out during the, the kind of tourist season there. Um, and my hours were about 10.45 in the morning or 12.45 um, for roughly a 10-hour day, um, four days a week. So it was really easy, really easy. Um, and then I was in Minneapolis for the past couple of months working in a bakery. Um, and in Vermont, it's a wholesale bakery, so the production schedule is a lot different. And in Minneapolis, I, was just, I just got back from there on Monday. Um, and I was working in a really small retail bakery. So all the bread was baked that morning in-house, and it was mixed and shaped, um, proofed and baked, which is, I did all of that. Um, and that shift started at either 1 or 2 AM. So <laughs> if I get a little sleepy, forgive me. I'm, I'm still kind of, it's, it's a couple hours past my bedtime, and I'm readjusting. So there's, you know. The wholesale bakery hours are very leisurely, and the 
retail bakery hours are are pretty pretty rugged. Yeah, so I think it's really important because I don't think most people think about it. No, because you go into a bakery and the stuff is ready and you're like, great, this is fine. And you don't see any bakers, so you don't really don't think about it. But what you don't realize is that you're in there and the bakers have already finished an eight hour shift. And it's, you know, you're getting your cup of coffee. So <laughs> it's a different So these a different are the life. people that are really helping us enjoy our mornings. Yes working those kind of shifts. And Helly said when I asked her if she could be on the show, she said, I don't know, I'm, I, you know, I, my eyes start closing about 6, 6.30, so. <laughs> Actually, I would go to bed between 4.30 and 5.30, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm getting better. <laughs> okay, so now you're on your way back to San Francisco because? Um, I'm gonna be working in another bakery out there, focusing, so I've been focusing on bread production. Um, and I'm gonna be focusing on viennoiserie, which is the, uh, pastry style from Vienna, um, which is, includes croissants and Danish and brioche. And so that kind of family of, of more enriched doughs. Yeah. So I'm going to be focusing on that. Let's see. I'm going to be in San Francisco on January 20th, oh, actually. Yes. Nice. Excellent. Yes. You'll have to come visit. Uh, if I can, I'm going to try to do that. Definitely. Good. Yeah. That sounds yeah. good. And... Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's funny because we're doing a radio show, but things happen here because it's a live audience. And sometimes I understand what people are getting at. Sometimes James is making, you know, he's like trying to get my attention about stuff and I have no idea what he's saying, you know, what he's talking about. Anyway, that for all of our listeners, there's something, there was something going on about moving things around. So that's, that's, that's fine. So uh, you must be excited about that. I'm really excited. I mean, excited. I'm excited. I'm super excited. I love the Bay Area and I'm just really excited to be back there and be back in the bakery culture that's present in in San Francisco and uh, Berkeley and Oakland. So, All right, we're going to get to the nuts in just a few minutes. But first, I want to talk to Al Davis because, Al, you have come from a baking family. I do. My, my dad started a bakery in 1939, and, he, and before that he was a baker. You know, he dropped out of high school. And he dropped out of high school, and uh, he... He ended up uh, with 39 little bakeries and a fairly extensive wholesale business. And uh, our specialty in Cleveland was sour, uh, a sourdough rye. Which, oh, which, nice. I, yeah. love, I love rye breads. And he was good. I love he was, rice. He was a good baker, but his schedule was slightly more nuts than he was a six day, 12 hour yeah. oh, well. kind of schedule. Yeah. And uh, he just had enormous energy. Uh, but it still goes on. It still goes on. My cousin, uh, takes care of it, but the whole thing was a big family event for myself anyway, uh, as a kid. And uh, you know. and did you go to the bakery often and, and do little jobs, that type uh, of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I panned chocolate chip cookies, racks and racks of chocolate chip cookies, and uh, that was a, a lot of fun stuff to do. I, I think I consumed more than I should have, because <laughs> I, I was a real pudgy little kid, which I'm still a pudgy person, but um, yeah. I, Eventually, I went on and, and made donuts on the weekends, and and uh, and I tried to work the schedule like the 12 o'clock to, to 9 in the morning schedule, making pastry, yeah. but that was too too nuts for me. I think it's pretty close to. It's getting there. Getting, it's at 2:57. We needed to go to 3:50. What you was the name of the bakery, Al? Davis Bakery still exists in, in, in on the east side of Cleveland. Uh, do you have your little chocolate chips? The little chocolate chips. Remember that we... Yes, we purchased those, didn't we? I wonder. They must be in that bag. Hallie's finding them right now. That's perfect. That's great. So you, you th was this one of the specialties? Was Ruglach one of the specialties? Yeah, it still still is. Uh, probably slightly different formula than the original one, but it still still sells. Um, so, yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about how what we need to make this at home, because it's very simple, right? This recipe is very simple. It's a pound of flour, a pound of cream cheese, and a pound of butter. You can cut everything in half if you want to make fewer. Th this recipe is for 64 little pastries. If you do the if you do the crescents, and if you want to do them in logs, which these are sort of the log shaped ones, you just cut a roll of log and slice it up. You can get about a hundred pieces, which is nice if you're entertaining on a, a larger scale. Um, but then you make a filling, and the filling basically is very simple too. It's uh, two cups of toasted 
walnuts, and I say it's toasted because that brings the oil to the surface and makes it a little more interesting to, as a taste goes, and a tablespoon of cinnamon, a cup of sugar, and a cup of raisins. And you can chop the raisins if you want to. They make things a little easier. I did that in this particular case. And you sort of want to, there's sometimes the raisins stick together and somehow you want to just sort of move them around a little bit so when you lay them on the uh, crescent pieces of dough, uh, it's, they're easier to work with. So you don't get big glops of raisins, which I've had in the past. And to make the dough, what do you do then? Oh, to make the dough, you take... You just throw it in here. You got two pound, You've got a, uh, two a, sticks of that's butter. That's half. Now, right. This is a half recipe. Right. Two I did. sticks of butter going into yeah. a mixer. Yep. Yep. Into and a KitchenAid. And the with a paddle attachment. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You can use. You can <laughs> use a dough. You can use a dough hook. You can because if the mixer isn't quite what you're hoping for. But um, let me see. And then the, here's a half a pound of flour, and I measured this in advance thinking it would be a nuisance to bring my little scale here. But um, four cups of flour is equivalent to about a pound of, of you know, yeah, you probably do everything by weight. I, I mean, do by, so. and I work with kilograms, so. Yeah, I'm right, right, right. <laughs> not the so, best task, but yeah. Anyway, I'll, I'm just going to mix this a little bit, and the hope is it will I've never used this mixer before, so who knows if it'll. <laughs> okay, so we've got. A half of what do we have? How many how many cups of flour? Uh, Four cups. Eight ounces of cream cheese, eight ounces of butter, eight ounces of flour, and the Which flour. Is about two cups of flour. Two cups of yes, flour. Yes, exactly. And, and at first we did the cream cheese and the butter. Does the butter have to be at room temperature or? Uh, almost. Almost at room almost. temperature, it's and the, the cream cheese also. Yeah, close. Okay, close. So we're we're just kind of creaming those like together, and then we're going to add the flour. You guys yep. work on that over there. Yep. Whoops, That's good. This is, this is the tack of the flour. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. It's so spin for a little while. All right. And then once it's, you, you see it's you know getting sort of mixed together, then you you take it out, make a big ball of it, divide it into um, a number of pieces. Like in this case, uh, if you're doing a pound of flour and a pound of butter and a pound of cream cheese. You divide it into, thank you, um, and you can just divide it into eight pieces, eight, eight round little pieces, put it in the refrigerator, let it chill down 12 to 24 hours, and then you're good to go to the next step, which the next step is this. I'll stop this, because this is... We're going to post this recipe, you're going to give me this recipe, and then we'll post yes. it on the blog. And then you can use different fillings. The filling that, I, you know, that I've done a lot of is cinnamon one tablespoon, this is again if you're using a pound of flour, pound of butter, and a pound of cream cheese, and two cups. I did pecans, toasted pecans. I don't know why I did it, maybe for the southern influence. I don't know. Uh, and, Bob Blankenship uh, will be happy about that. He'll, you made his I, evening. That's right. And uh, so, and, and a pound of, uh, of, you know, what amounts to uh, half a, well, a cup of sugar. In this case, it's a half a cup of sugar because we're, we're reducing this, the size thing a little bit. Then you can just take it, sprinkle it on your little wedges. I'll just do a few. So basically, it's a very simple process, but it does require a little forethought because you have to chill the dough for 12 to 24 hours. Yeah, you could even probably get away with less. I saw a number of different ways of doing it that you said a few hours. But, you know, safety first. Anyway, you just roll it from the, the, the wide end, the wide end up. Can everybody see that? If you can't see it, if you, uh, unfortunately, this mirror cannot be tilted. That's one of, the, one of the drawbacks here. But you can come up. It's fine. Just come up and take a look. Don't get too close. About right here would be good. Okay. <laughs> you, you just roll it to a little crescent. You, you, you know, bend it a little bit for cutesy look. And... So basically, you're just putting the filling on top, and I'd say that you, are you are you actually flattening it all out, or are you just evenly spreading it? What evenly spreading is okay. Okay, evenly spreading it and on the crescent. Yeah, and it always sort of runs over the side, and that's mm -hmm. just the nature of the beast. And I try to get the little tab of dough down at the bottom, because if you don't, it springs up while you're baking it, and then stuff debris flies everywhere. So you're rolling from the 
wide, wide side to the pointed side. Yep. And for everybody who's not here, the crescent piece of dough is for the crescent shape, but it's actually like a wedge, like a pie wedge. That's exactly. And you, so more of a triangular shape, and then it becomes the crescent. Like and as a matter of fact, a great, which thank you for finding this, I left mine at home. A pizza wheel is a wonderful way to cut the dough. Uh, it just makes it a lot easier than using a knife, which it sort of sticks to. And you don't have to use uh, the cinnamon and the sugar and uh, and the walnuts or pecans, depending on what. Don't use almonds, even though people say, oh, you can use any nut you want. Almonds just don't have enough, you know, guts as a taste goes. I would suggest walnuts. But uh, And you can use currants. You can use cranberries. You know, there's all kinds of variations on the theme. Um, We're going to use some chocolate. Even. And you can use chocolate. If, right. I could, if I can open this. Yep. Now, we're going we're, <laughs> we're to let you keep rolling. Okay. And, and uh, Helly, are you about ready to show us how to easily candy some nuts? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So what do we need for that? <laughs> so, yeah, pecans. We're doing pecans tonight. Um, so... I, for Christmas gifts, I just did some candied nuts and little chocolates and stuff for my family and friends. Um, and I love doing it. I forgot how much fun and how easy it is. So I thought it was perfect for tonight. Um, so all you need is the nut of your cho choice. And you want to make sure, <laughs> sorry, uh, it's get, getting late for me. Um, you want to make sure that it's a not, not a toasted nut because in the candying process, the nut's going to get toasted, and if it's already toasted, chances are it's going to burn. Um, so I'm using pecans. Um, almonds are great. Hazelnuts are wonderful. And almonds and hazelnuts are probably the more traditional nuts for this style, for dredges, um, which are also oftentimes coated in chocolate or Jordan almonds are in the same category. It's just any, any little candy nut, whatever, that's coated, basically. Um, so we're using pecans, and then all we need is sugar, water, and salt. Um, you can put a tiny bit of honey in later on in the process, um, but it's really super simple, really fun. You want to have two pots, two clean pots ready to go, um, and I'll explain why in a minute. But um, as far as the proportions go, I'm just eyeballing it tonight, but um, what you want is about a, a quarter of the weight in sugar as nuts. So if you have a pound of nuts, you want a quarter pound of sugar and then a pinch of salt to taste. Um, and we have like a pound and a half of nuts and I'm just gonna throw in about a cup of sugar, I think is about right. Um, and I mean, it's, it's what you don't use, um, it's just gonna stay in the pot. So it really doesn't matter. You just wanna make sure you have enough sugar to coat all the nuts. Um, and what you're going to do is make just a wet sand. I'll bring this over so you can see. Um, so fo for, can you see? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, this is, you can even do a little less water. It's just going to take an extra, you know, half a minute probably to get to the right consistency. Um, and um, you're just going to melt the sugar in the water. Um, and it's going to start bubbling fast. And then when it's about the right temperature, which is roughly 235, 240 degrees, um, the bubbles are going to start to slow. So they're still going to be big bubbles, but they pop slower. Um, and that's the right temperature. I mean, you can also take a candy thermometer and try and get the temperature, but it changes so quickly. Um, and it's just kind of a hassle. So <laughs> it's easy to just what we're looking it. for exactly. So what we're doing is we're melting all the sugar um, and the bubbles, it's going to be boiling. It's going to be boiling fast. Um, and then at a certain point, the because it gets thick enough, enough water has evaporated that it's going to start to slow. So the bubbles take longer to pop. And that's what you're looking for. And you can kind of see it. And it's and the color will darken a little bit also. Um, you know, you don't want it to get brown, but it'll definitely, definitely get a little, a little color going. Um, and what kind of heat are we using? Medium heat? I'm using, you know, I've, I've done this on so many different stoves and it hasn't been the same any time. Um, I'm doing high just to get the, 
just to get it going. And then as soon as it starts to bubble and the sugar begins to melt, I'm going to turn it down to like medium, roughly. We'll see. I've never used this stove, so it's just kind of, you know. I can already smell it. Hit or miss, yeah. Smell that sugar. Mm. You can feel it coursing through your veins. Yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're going to be using two pots. Um, and the reason for that is the first, and the sugar is going to caramelize on the nuts twice. The first one is um, just getting an even coating um, on the nuts. And it's going to be smooth, and you keep stirring it. And as you stir sugar, if you're making caramelous, if you agitate it too much, if you stir it too much, it'll recrystallize. And then you get like a grainy, a grainy caramel. So um, when you're doing the nuts, they're going to recrystallize. It's going to look sandy again, and I'll show you guys in a couple minutes. Um, and so what you do is you transfer it to a clean pot, and you leave any extra sugar in. So you have a nice light coating of sugar on the nuts. And then you're going to heat that in the clean pot until, um, until they're glassy. They're glossy, and they, they're shiny and smooth. And then you get a really nice, a really nice um, shiny finished product. Um, but, you know, by all means, if you run out of time, if you only have one clean pot, just do it the first time and it's, you know, they still, they're still tasty. They're just not as shiny. So, and we're not going to worry about then the recrystallization then? Well, we are. We are going to worry about oh, it. Oh, yeah. We've got two pots. Okay. So, we shouldn't worry about it anyway because. <laughs> um, and I'm putting in, you know, a good amount of salt. You're listening to, to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. I'm Steve Boss. Helly Claire Witherspoon is with us making candied nuts. Al Davis is here making rugula. And Dick Alexander is going to join us in just a few minutes, and he's going to talk about sea urchins. And that's going to be Tom. Al Tom, I think what we should do is you should actually sing your song before Dick talks about sea urchins. I think that, that, that sounds so... Uh, perfect, actually, for, for the intro to the whole thing. It'll be hard to follow, I'm sure. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if anyone's up to it or not. All right. Okay, Al. Do you have any more? T you? I noticed that you put a wash on top of that. That's exactly what I did, and that's just uh, milk and sugar. Some people like eggs, but it turns out that the milk and sugar gives the same color, which is a nice golden brown color, and that's what we like to have. Um, just simple. It's a Let's see, half a cup of milk and a teaspoon of sugar for the pound, pound, pound recipe. So that's Excellent. an easy way to go. All right, well, we'll look forward to getting that recipe so we can put it up. The, I'm going to try the raspberry one, too. Right. Okay, uh, Al's going to make another kind also for us. He, was, he wanted to make, sorry, one sec. He, he wanted to make uh, a, a prune one, right? Yeah. But, but we couldn't find the necessary ingredients, so we're going to do raspberry. I think that'll be delicious, actually. I think it'll work. Okay. So I'm just going to see if I can show you guys the, um, the sugar syrup is bubbling pretty rapidly, um, and I mean, well, it's off the heat, so it's slowing down now, but you can see when you're, when you're doing it, it'll get a lot thicker. Um, so it's kind of like the same technique you want to do for popcorn. When the popcorn, <laughs> she's like looking at me like, what are you talking I'm about, like, right? I'm, I'm, because when the popcorn starts to slow down, Right, popping, the popping noises. You know you better start paying attention because if you don't pay really close attention, you're going to burn it. Yep. So, and then when it stops basically altogether for one, two seconds, you want to get it off the stove. So what you're okay. asking, what you're telling everybody is that they've got to watch for those bubbles to start slowing down. Yes. Okay. Yep. So we're going to do that. That's, that's very important. Tom Allen, treat us. We want to hear all about the sea urchins. Is this your own composition, by the way? My own production. Okay. Maybe sorry you asked. But anyway, <laughs> this is called Searching for the Urchin. And, uh, no, we need to hear you, buddy. Okay. Um, okay. Searching for an urchin. My future is uncertain. If I don't find that spiny guy. My future, I can kiss goodbye. My dreams will fall down from the sky. Send my knees into the bush, the spines will please to 
Tom Allen. <laughs> Tom, don't quit your J job. Uh, before we get to Dick, Helly, tell us what's up here. <laughs> so the bubble start is slow, so I put the um, I put the nuts in, um, and now I'm just stirring it, and they get kind of stringy. They're going to get coated, and um, you can actually even turn the heat off pretty much at this point, um, just for the time being. Um, and it's going to recrystallize, so all the all the sugar is going to get sandy, and it looks like the pecans are coated in. So you've got to get it coated really before it starts to recrystallize, don't you? Right, right. That's a exactly. key step. Yeah. So don't start stopping and eating and you know, oh, I got to taste this. And yeah. See, and just, yeah. No. Just keep stirring, right? Yeah. And this pot is a little small, so right. we'll see. Right. All right. All right. It all works. Call us. Signal me when it's time for the next step, will you? I will. Meantime, I'm going to talk to Dick Alexander because he's got to talk about those sea urchins. Dick, welcome to Great Taste. Thank you. Good to be here. So tell us all a little bit about why did Tom write that song? <laughs> well, he called me up and wondered what the heck I was doing, you know, <laughs> getting sea urchins. And uh, I uh, it was back in the late 60s, and I'd been uh, diving for uh, animals, uh, marine animals for teaching and research. And uh, sending them all over the world for this guy work for it. <clears throat> and that got a little old, so I, I decided to go out on my own. I was, figured I would get some sea urchins for the uh, Italian fishermen. And uh, they didn't have them up, up where they were in Monterey or North Beach in San Francisco. So I uh, kind of searched around. Uh, there was no problem finding them. They were all over the floor of the ocean. And... Uh, as a matter of fact, what happened was there was a, there used to be a balance between sea urchins and abalone. And then people wiped the abalone out because they're delicious. Nobody liked the sea urchins, apparently. And uh, so they were everywhere and easy to collect. I just could dive down, get a bag full, go up, put them in a garbage can, put some, some seaweed on them, and uh, put them in my 1946 school bus and run them up, to, uh, up the coast. So... Um, uh, I tried them just just to see what they tasted like, and they 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 taste like a bottle of iodine to me, you know. That, but I think they're a bit of an acquired taste. But the but the the fishermen loved them. The the uh, attack, they had to be from the coast in Italy. Fortunately, Italy had a lot of coast, and uh, so there were a lot of people that wanted them. But uh, what they would do is they'd take them, they'd crack them open, and uh, you know, alive. And just take a spoon and some bread and a little wine and just sit back and have a party where they loved them. I sold them for 25 cents each, which is, you know, a little below market nowadays. And uh, um, that's basically the story. When I, when I got ready to, to finish uh, and I was going back to, uh, I was going to Florida to get in the, the hotel restaurant business. And... Um, I was really eager to go, but just then I found someone who says he had a market for them. And I said, well, uh, I'm leaving, but what is it? And he, and he didn't tell me, so I left. And later on I found out he was selling them, wanted to sell them to Japan, which I never thought of. And they would they did, had a whole different method. I would dive down, pick up a few, you know, go up on top. They had this huge vacuum cleaner that they used there. You know, it's a, a marine vacuum cleaner with holes about, well, about like this. And he just about like this is about a uh, foot and a half wide in circumference? About a foot wide or a little bit less, yes. Forgot I was on radio. Um, but so anyway, um, they would pull them up and somebody would be up top. They'd crack them open and dump out, dump out the urchins and then bags and cool them and then freeze them, send them over to Japan. And they... Uh, Basically, by the time I got back to California, which was probably uh, six, five or six years, the urchins were wiped out of the coast of Southern California because they'd gotten so many boats, all these people that do, did that, and uh, the Japanese loved them. And so the urchins were gone, but one side benefit of that was the kelp beds came back because the sea urchins ate the kelp. They, they destroyed the whole fast, which is kind of a root system for the, uh, for the kelp, and uh, kelp float out to sea and just get destroyed. But but with the urchins gone, the kelp came back. And this is very rich seabed. So, you know, that was basically it. So that's pretty much the story. Uh, that's just really fascinating, though, in terms of the whole environmental, the eco balances. And, you know, the first the urchins come because everybody eats all the abalone. Mm -hmm. The urchins wipe out the kelp. The urchins get farmed, uh, get 
picked by the Japanese and there aren't any more urchins, and so the kelp comes back, and I'm sure that also brings other sea life with it. Oh, tons of sea life. Yeah, there's, there's, they're just, uh, it's a complete ecosystem in the kelp beds themselves. I mean, they, you look in there and you look closely and you see little tiny fish everywhere of every kind. And it's fabulous to, for it to come back. Unfortunately, the abalone didn't come back because, you know, people would pick them off just as soon as they got size big enough to eat. No, they're very, very expensive if, you've ever, if you find them on menus. Yeah, they're expensive and, and very delicious, too. I mean, they're great. Also, if you have any allergic tendencies uh, <laughs> with uh, fish, abalone is one of the ones that people sometimes have some extreme uh, allergic reactions to. I had a, actually a sales representative who ended up uh, in the emergency room after having some abalone. He enjoyed it, uh, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, yes, I, I wasn't sea urchins. This is when I was uh, diving up, you know, various marine animals, and I was coming back down the coast, Pacific Coast Highway, and you really had to get back to the lab fast because these things were very fragile, some of them were. And uh, so I had this van, and I was just flying down to get to the lab, and suddenly this guy walks right out in the middle of the road. You can't stop too fast. I hit the brakes and went up, stopped about a foot away from him, turned around and gave me a real big smile. It was Burt Lancaster. I just about wiped him out. <laughs> he was very gracious about it. And why was he in the middle of the road to begin with? Uh, I don't know. Maybe he'd had a nip or two or something. I don't know. So I, I was thinking the same thing. Yes, Kelly. Okay. So the um, pecans are nice and sandy. Um, and they've been pretty evenly coated. They'd be a little bit more even if I had a bigger pot, but that's okay. They look beautiful. Yeah. So um, that's the first step, basically. That's right? the first step. And so the first um, melting of the sugar, let me just dump these. Um, the first melting of the sugar is just to get the coating on the nuts, to get them evenly coated. And a lot of times this is where people stop, um, but it just takes a couple more minutes to, to get a nice finished product. And at this point too, um, like I said, I eyeballed the amount of sugar that I did today and I used too much. There's, there's a bit extra, so I just left it in the pot because I don't want that on the nuts. Um, so now I'm going to turn the temperature on to about medium, and we'll see how it goes with this with this stove. Um, and we're just going to go until they um, until it melts and they're nice and smooth. And in the last um, the last couple seconds or so, 15 seconds maybe, I'm going to throw in some um, candy or some dried sour cherries um, to just go in there and. Add a little, a little something. little riff on the, on the regular yeah. candied pecans. I like that. Yeah. That, that, that'll be fun. Okay, so, yeah. so grab us again when, when it starts to uh, melt. I will. So we can, we can see exactly what it looks like. I, I just want to tell you, sea urchins uh, hold a very, as you found out, they hold a very dear place for Italians. And on the recent uh, semifinal of The Next Iron Chef, the three judges got to pick one ingredient that they wanted the three final chefs to use to present them with a dish. And one of the judges is Donatella Arpaia, and she picked sea urchin. And, and that ended up, well, interestingly enough, that chef ended up going to the final, and she actually ended up winning. But, but uh, in, that was uh, an ingredient that she loved. She was like so excited to get that ingredient to use. Well, they might be great cooked. I never tried them. I just tried that one spoonful, and I said, well, you know, maybe in another lifetime or something. But not, it was, uh, uh, but it's incredible. Those, those guys will set, they'll get 10 of them. And these things are the size of small grapefruits. I mean, without the spines, you know, there, there's a lot of meat in there. And they'll just sit and just eat and eat and eat. I don't know how they do it. One thing that I, I I'm going to get to you in just one second. One thing I want to um, just have you relate to everybody because I got such a kick out of it was you were one of your other experiences in the food business was you were working in in uh, Aspen mm -hmm. in a restaurant you were di washing dishes actually yeah, right dishes, a professional dishwasher <laughs> and what happened uh, well anyway no I, I just moved to Aspen and I wanted to work in a restaurant and ski in the daytime you know so um, I uh, uh, was Actually, I I, held, I was dishwashing, but they they had me do a few things in the kitchen. One of the things is to uh, there's a it was a real real nice restaurant called Stromberg's, and uh, they um, for example they make their salads in a walk-in cooler. 
they wouldn't even bring them out until they were just right ready to serve, you know, very crisp. And so there was, a, there was this uh, Irish guy that worked in there, and I, I walked into the one day, one night to uh, open the uh, walk-in, and he fell out on the ground. And he'd been in the uh, cooking wine. <laughs> and so I, suddenly I had to make salads, you know, for that evening. It was the first time. <laughs> so that was my first experience. And, and, then, and then these two, the chef and the, and the broiler man had been working together for probably around 20 years. You know, and they were very, very, they knew each other's moves very well. And the chef, uh, suddenly he was at the bar after work one night and just killed over, had a stroke, and about a day later he was gone. And he didn't have anybody to do it. And I'd been helping him spoon a little bit, a little this and that. Nothing formal at all. They said, Dick, uh, how would you like to be a chef? <laughs> <laughs> and this this place was really busy, too, you know. And, and, and so uh, I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. So I did it uh, the first night. This is no kidding. This first night, they broke all the records in, the, in how many uh, tables they had or how many people in there. And I did it for about two weeks, you know, so they could find someone else. And I was just an automation, you know. I never could have done it without the broiler man. Broiler man was, he knew all the moves and everything. And he, but I just, and I can't even remember what I cooked exactly. Just kept doing it and doing it. We never had a dish come back. Or it was all a blur. It was all a blur, exactly. Yeah, it, but but they they actually were gonna let me go on, but I want I was there to ski, so I I said I'll I'll wash dishes for a while longer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story, Dick. And you had some some interesting personalities that came through there during that time too, right? Uh, oh yeah, I think uh, some people live there, like uh, Leon Uris, uh, the uh, uh, writer. Um, let's see, uh, Buckmaster Fuller was living there. Um, Let's see. Well, you know, I mean, Aspen is a lot of glamour and stuff. So just about everybody that's in show business sooner or later comes through there. And uh, I remember Jill St. John was there in a, uh, she was, uh, there, there was a standing party on Monday nights when the place was closed. And this guy had a, a $2 million two-bedroom house. Really just fabulous. I'd probably be a $15 million, $15 million house now. It's just beautiful. And so he would, he, he drank there. He was he had the only rolls in Aspen at that time. He drank a quart of Jim Beam every night at our, at our bar, and then he, you know, he'd say, "Oh, now let's go to my house." You know, of course, nobody went except on Monday night, and then we'd all go out there a lot of times, and he'd he just throw a party. And then one, you know, Jill St. John was there one night. I don't know. She's she's been out of out of the film for a while, but she was she was really good uh, uh, actress. I thought, well, she was looked good at least. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was uh, there was, she was with a guy named Jack Jones who was a singer. He sounded a lot like Sinatra. Um, and uh, uh, Dick's not dating himself by by the way with with the names that he's throwing around. <laughs> yeah, there's no no current ones I don't think. Uh, um, Jean Claude Keeley was there about two or three times, and he was a fabulous skier. Of course, I'm sure people remember him. And, you know, just the list goes on and on. Every, but the rest of them I didn't have too much to do. I'd see them, you know, and this and that. But uh, Aspen, if you ever get a chance and, you know, you have a few pennies in your pocket and you can go there and, and it's, it's better than Hollywood to sit around looking for people. Well, it's still home of the most famous, I guess, food and wine festival in the United States. And, yes, uh, it's in the summer and it costs a pretty penny to attend it, by the way, several thousand dollars. Yeah, everything is expensive in Aspen. You know, you get an aspirin and it costs a lot. <laughs> but, by the way, at Aspen, I think I mentioned this on the show before, anybody going to Chicago sometime soon should know Bob Blankenship has been to the restaurant, been to Nightwood. Um, the chef there, Jason Vincent, won... Uh, and in Aspen this past summer, he won King of Pork, <laughs> and but he cooks lots of other things besides just pork. But but uh, Nightwood is a great restaurant if you have uh, some free weekend you want to get up to Chicago over the next uh, few months, uh, and you'll you won't miss that experience. is a great experience, and you can sit right in the kitchen if you make sure to reserve when you call up to reserve a table. We just tell him you want to sit at the kitchen bar, and you want to sit in the far right seat, if and then people can sit after you there that's where you want to sit though that's where the action is and it's a lot of fun all right heli what's happening with those nuts because they're smoking away they're starting to smoke a little bit the sugar you know it's a, it's right still, it's fine they've smoked every time i've made them so far and they've tasted great um so the sugar's almost remelted so i just threw the cherries in so they can kind of catch catch some of those sugars 
So um, we'll put the cherries, or if we're going to add any fruit like that, dried fruit, it's got to be right at the end. Yeah, because I don't want them to burn. And, that, you know, I don't know what the what the technical proper way of doing that is. I just had some lying around one time, and so I threw them in. Um, and these are almost ready. Um, and I will... Now, the other thing is, I'm not going to put any butter in here, um, but if you want to... I'm not going to put any butter in. Yes, Steve, you heard me correctly. <laughs> Probably the only thing that I'll say that about. Um, I, you can put butter in to, to make them individual. Um, but then you have to you know, separate them all out still when they're hot. Um, but the butter helps with that. I, I really like the aesthetic of having kind of a, just pressing them out and spreading them out so it's kind of a lacy sheet of candied nuts. It's really beautiful with hazelnuts. Um, and then you just kind of have like a nice decoration. Um, and they just look really nice. Speaking of hazelnuts, yes, I was reading the other day because when we were making our biscotti, we were trying to get the skin off of this particular type of hazelnut that we decided the skin does not come off of. <laughs> because it, it wasn't happening, no matter what we tried. And we were reading about different techniques, because we always baked them, and yeah. then used a towel, you know, and just kind of... And just rub them Right, rub together. them. But somebody, uh, a couple of people mentioned that you should boil the nuts for like 10 minutes, hmm. and then dry them, and then the skins would just come right off. Oh, interesting. I've never... Never heard of that one? I've never... Well, I haven't really done it that often. Yeah. So. Well, anyway, I guess if you want to take the shortcut... Get the yeah. kind of hazelnuts we got. I don't know the the variety, but they definitely uh, the skin wasn't coming off. And the reason you want the skin off, besides the looks, is just also because of the fact that sometimes it gets very bitter. The the skin can be really bitter, but the skin on these hazelnuts wasn't bitter at all, so it was fine. Hi, Bob. Yeah, yeah I've I've used that approach with almonds. You know, boil it for a minute and a half, and then and they, you know, the skins will come off easily. Yes, or you can soak almonds too. You don't even need to boil them, but it pro that takes a little bit longer. Yeah, yeah. So it, uh, that uh, probably would work, I would think. How was your shrimp dish? Um, very good. Yeah, shrimp etouffee I made recently. Yeah, shrimp etouffee. Yeah. yeah, you're gonna have to. You're gonna make that here sometime. Um, we'll see. <laughs> this is Bob's standard answer whenever I ask him if he's going to make something on the show. Is we'll see because he never feels like his dish is good enough. He's got to continue to experiment with it. Uh, I don't think that's true. I've eaten Bob's cooking before, and it's absolutely wonderful. So, so hopefully we'll get him. You know, maybe maybe you guys need to you know give him a little encouragement. You know, yeah. and, and and so so I think that uh, that's that's an endorsement. You need to come on the show and 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 do that. You know, I think that's another thing we're going to do this year is we're going to get people like Darren Hain to come up and make some food for us. You know, people who are local who have special things that they do and they love doing them. Um, these guys are done. There's, they're pretty, pretty smooth. Most of the, um, most of the sugar is re-caramelized. That's so going that's to be in this. For, right? yep. Sugar re-caramelizes, and then you're, you've got a parchment yeah. paper. Yeah. I have a sheet pan lined mm -hmm. with parchment paper, um, and I'm put, just dumping them out on there. And now, what are you going to do? Um, I'm going to put some water in the pot so it's easier to clean, um, <laughs> and then. You want to be careful doing this. I, my hands are fine with a lot of heat um, and sugar. So, um, but I'm just kind of pressing them out. Um, Press them out to make an even layer. Is yeah, that what to it make is? an even layer. Um, just because that's the way I like it. Um, and yeah. And, and then let them cool a little right. bit, and they'll crisp up. And so, about nice how layer. long do they need to cool? Just until they're back down to room temperature. Um, and that'll be I mean, you could eat them right now, but they're not going to be as good. They're but probably we need to soft. wait about a half hour or so. Everybody will want to go probably before they're ready, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. yeah. Don't, don't worry Definitely about it. Definitely after eight. <laughs> Next week on Great Taste, we're going to have a very interesting discussion. We're going to have local people, local producers with us. Also, some people who are involved in the Market on Main project in Ottumwa, including the director of the Indian Hills Culinary Program, Gordon Rader, will be here. He's been a driving force behind that project. And we'll have local people, as I mentioned, local producers. We're going to have a discussion on local regional food economies and the problems with cooperating between different regions 
because everybody wants to have their own little local food economy, but we also have to see if we can think a little bit broader. So that's next week on Great Taste. The Indian Hills Culinary Crew will be here providing some tastes for all of us who are attending and listening to the participants talk about local regional food economies. On um, the third week of the year and the fourth week of the year, I have to disappoint everybody and tell you we're not going to be live at hy V those third, third and fourth week. So please watch your emails uh, because I already had somebody, a couple of people actually say, I was here last week. Where were you? <laughs> I said, don't you read your email? And they go, oh. So, so anyway, next week we're live and the next two weeks we will be uh, because I'll be away. Anyway, you've been listening to Great Taste on KRUU 100.1 FM, the solar-powered voice of Fairfield, Iowa. Hallie Claire Witherspoon has been here and teaching us wonderfully easy and simple way to make candy nuts. And uh, too bad everybody's going to be going home before they get to try them. Yep, Al Davis. Tell us a little about those arugula. They look beautiful. I think they turned out pretty good. Yeah, you know, the little odd uh, oven thing because I'm not used to. But um, I want to mention when you roll out the dough, uh, you, you could get it to a sixteenth of an inch. That would be wonderful. Most people get it between an eighth and a sixteenth when they're rolling it out. And uh, that was the one big tidbit. <laughs> well, um, it, they, they're really gorgeous. And again, you know, I think that they have to cool probably. So yeah, everybody it, will be gone. Yeah, and, it's yeah. too bad. Oh, well. Anyway, maybe next week there'll be something that'll be ready in time. Dick, we want to thank you. Very entertaining, really great stories. And uh, maybe if you can think of some more food stories, you come back and tell us. Uh, sure, if I can think of some more food stories. Otherwise, I'll just be here to eat. <laughs> We're happy if that if that's the case. So, can't we do that? Can you do what? Take the goodies home and let they have them to cool, cool on home. the sheet pans. Yeah, it's too bad, you know. <laughs> well, it's it's life, you know. Sometimes you just get disappointment. I mean, there's disappointment. You are listening, by the way, as we mentioned, you're listening to Great Taste on Crew FM, and I just want everybody to know that Crew is not only solar powered, but it's also community powered. Community powered radio station that actually needs do your donations to uh, actually continue on the air. So, if you love this show and you love the other programming that's on Crew, because we have as my father said, the most unique and varied programming of any radio station he's ever listened to. And he's been around for 86 or 87 years. So I think that's that's a pretty good right, James. That's pretty good as far as uh, crew. 99% of the programming is locally produced. And there are amazing people that are on every week. So you can easily donate to crew. You can just go to Facebook the crew Facebook page, right? And there's the website and you can just hit a button and, and you're in. It's very, very simple and easy to do. So look how fast that was. That was like 30 seconds where if you listen to NPR, I mean, they go on for hours about how, you know, give me money, you know? So <laughs> it's really, really simple to do it here. Now, what I'm going to do as soon as we get, as soon as we eat all these goodies is I'm going to go watch Downton Abbey because I have to catch up before Sunday when the third season starts. And one of the cool things you can do is you can look at all the food that they're serving and you can also watch them make tea, which is interesting because they're constantly doing that. So see, everything revolves around food in my life. It's, it's fantastic. Tom, play us something, will ya? And everyone enjoy some great tastes between now and the next show. Thanks, Steve. Great taste. Sweet, sour, so good to taste.